David Hume. Um, it's very appropriate, of course, that this event should take place here at the RSE. Uh, it was founded shortly after the death of Hume in 1783 as Scotland's National Academy of Science and Letters. And the aims of the RSE to advance learning and useful knowledge uh, resonate with the work of David Hume as a philosopher, a social scientist, and a historian, Hume being the doyen of the Scottish Enlightenment and a figure who is very much associated with our city here in Edinburgh. I'd like to express a word of thanks to the two co-sponsors of tonight's event. These are the Institute for Advanced Study in Humanities at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, the Institute has existed since 1969 to promote interdisciplinary uh, research in the humanities and the social sciences. It organizes a variety of research themes, seminars, and hosts fellows who are based at the Institute, which is uh, on the edge of the central campus of the university beside the meadows. Uh, for many years now, the Institute has had uh, a, a, a series of directors um, whose work um, has done much to promote the study of David Hume in this interdisciplinary context. And uh, IASH, as we call it, um, has been much involved in the organization of a whole series of events in Edinburgh to mark the, the tercentenary of Hume. Uh, tonight's lecture is also sponsored by the Journal of Scottish Philosophy, which is now based at the Centre for the Study of Scottish Philosophy in Princeton. And we are grateful to the director of the Centre, Professor Gordon Graham, who is also a, a fellow of uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, I have very briefly to draw your attention to two housekeeping matters. Um, one of them is already before you on the screen in the event of the fire alarm sounding. You should uh, make your way through the nearest uh, emergency exits um, and congregate outside the George Hotel where you should avoid being blown over in the gale. Um, you might prefer indeed to go inside uh, the George Hotel tonight um, in the event of fire alarm. Um, and secondly, uh, I'm asked to remind you to switch off your mobile phones. Um, as our speaker does so, let me uh, <laughs> introduce uh, him to you. Uh, Dr. Peter Milliken is Gilbert Ryle Fellow and Reader in Early Modern Philosophy at Hartford College in the University of Oxford. And we're fortunate to have him with us in Edinburgh as our alumni David Hume Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities. Um, Peter Milliken is one of the, the leading Hume scholars of his generation. He has broad philosophical interests, his publications covering a wide range, including epistemology, philosophy of language, and the relationship of computing to ethics and the philosophy of religion. Uh, he has an international reputation as a scholar of David Hume, um, his 2002 Oxford University Press monograph being entitled Reading Hume on Human Understanding, and he has also edited a, a new critical edition of Hume's First Inquiry. For some years, he was co-editor of the journal Hume Studies, and he's currently completing a book on Hume's famous essay on miracles. So there is really no one better qualified to speak to us tonight and to mark this tercentenary occasion than Dr. Milliken. The title of his lecture is The Significance of David Hume, Skepticism, Science and Superstition. Please welcome Dr. Milliken. Thank you very much, David. Um, that some, some of those comments, I must say, make me blush. I've, there is at least one extremely notable Hume scholar in the front row here, so I, I wouldn't endorse that there's no one better qualified, but it's very nice to be introduced in such terms. I think we'd better turn the lights down. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to try to cover quite a lot tonight, but I'm going to cover it quite briskly, and I'm not going to linger. And you will see that I've got a lot of slides here, uh, a lot of them covered in text, 
But I'm not expecting you actually to read very much of that text. I shall simply be glossing it as we go. It will be very familiar to some of you, unfamiliar to others. But I'm going to be putting all the slides up on uh, the davidhume.org website, so if you want to go back later and look at any of that stuff to get more detail, you're very welcome to do so. It's very hard talking in 45 minutes about David Hume. Uh, he did so much. Uh, there are so many aspects of his work one could pick out. I'm going to focus on one that's long fascinated me and which I think is absolutely key to his work and to understanding his life's mission. Uh, and that is the connection between his scepticism, his views on science, and his views on superstition. Uh, I didn't want to forget uh, thanks, which is very easy to do at the end of these things. So I would like to start by thanking the Royal Society very much for organising this event, inviting me to speak. Um, as you'll see later, we've got a new edition of David Hume's Dialogues on the davidhume.org website. Uh, I hope to have time to show you some of that uh, later in the talk. And I'm very grateful to the Royal Society and indeed the National Library of Scotland uh, for enabling those images to be made available on the web uh, for everyone to see for the very first time. Uh, it's lovely to be able to unveil that at this event. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Edinburgh alumni who provided the Hume Fellowship that brought me here. I've been here on and off uh, for the last uh, year or so, and I must say I've absolutely enjoyed being in Edinburgh. Wonderful environment uh, for study, uh, obviously for a Hume scholar particularly so, uh, but it, it really has been a great, great pleasure, and I'm extremely grateful to the alumni. Uh, also for the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, who've already been mentioned, delightful context to come and work here uh, with lovely scholars, lovely colleagues, and lots of interesting events going on. I'm also grateful to the Journal of Scottish Philosophy who supported this event. I'm also going to be introducing at the end um, Henry, uh, Aeneas Merivale, who's done a lot of work with me on the davidhume.org website. Without him, there's absolutely no way uh, that we could be aspiring to uh, reveal today uh, a new website which contains authoritative editions of all of Hume's main philosophical works. Um, Again, you'll see that later. Uh, but I'm very, very grateful to Henry for the work that he's put on, on that. Okay, now, I said I would be uh, going at quite a brisk pace. I'm starting all the way back with Aristotle. You'll see why soon. Here's Aristotle's universe. Of course, the Earth is at the center, a sphere of water outside that, then air, then fire, and then crystal spheres bearing all the various heavenly bodies. Well, Aristotelian science was based on the idea that the world is fundamentally intelligible, and intelligible in a particular way, because the way to understand how natural things behave, and that includes rocks as well as animals, is to see them as striving to fulfill a certain purpose. Now, in the case of rocks, their purpose is to get to the center of the universe. So it's absolutely fundamental to Aristotelian physics that the Earth be at the center of the universe. If it's not, then the whole theory falls apart. Things like the horror of a vacuum are brought in to explain the behavior of physical things. Again, we have the idea that there are purposes built into what we would think of as inanimate nature, which make how it behaves intelligible. Uh, why do the heavenly bodies move in circles? Well, they're striving to, as it were, achieve as close as they can to the perfection of the creator. Uh, circles have a sort of obvious uh, infinity to them, uh, which enables them to fulfill that. Along comes Galileo. And uh, <clears throat> he points out that Aristotle has difficulty explaining all sorts of things. Uh, which had be previously been taken for granted. If you look at old pictures of the flight of cannonballs, for example, uh, according to the Aristotelian theory, uh, the natural movement of a cannonball is downwards towards the center of the earth. So, therefore, when a cannonball is fired from a gun, well, it keeps going as long as the impetus pushes it, but when that gives up, it should fall more or less vertically. Uh, Gal Galileo pointed out that this isn't so. 
that actually missiles <coughs> follow something like a parabolic path. They descend with a similar curve to the curve when they went up. Or take a sledge sliding on flat ice. Suppose you're on a lake, you push a heavy sledge, and then you stop pushing, and the sledge keeps going. Why? For Aristotle, that's actually a bit of a problem. And uh, scholars came up with explanations like vortices in the air, pushing it along. Galileo came along with a quite different explanation. He said that things just naturally carry on moving in the same direction at the same speed unless they're acted on by a force. What needs explaining is why the sledge stops due to friction, not why it keeps going. A fundamentally different kind of explanation. But Galileo's telescopic observations were particularly fatal for Aristotle's theory. I mean, essentially, it became impossible to maintain uh, the previous theory of everything going around the sun. I haven't got time to go into detail on that now. <clears throat> but again, I want to focus on a fundamental difference in the type of explanation when we move from Aristotelian science to the sort of thing that Galileo, Descartes, Hobbes, and their followers uh, came up with. In Aristotelian science, physical things, behavior, gets explained according to, a, uh, as it were, a desire, a striving to reach a particular endpoint. Whereas in the new science, the mechanical philosophy, the outcome depends on where the causal sequence happens to lead. So the paradigm might be, say, billiard balls bashing into each other. You don't explain where the billiard ball moves in terms of it having a particular desire to move to a certain place. It's explained in terms of the forces acting on it. One thing bashes into another and makes it move. So we have inert matter pushed around rather than active matter rather than active matter, which is driven internally by its own purposes. So, <clears throat> Galileo's world was intelligible, but in a different way from Aristotle's. Galileo, Descartes, and so on, wanted to say that mechanical interaction of things is actually a better explanation of why things behave as they do than Aristotle's. Aristotle said, for example, with the stone, it strives to reach the center of the earth, that's why it falls. But exactly the same explanation could be used to explain anything at all. Suppose a stone suddenly went up in the air, you could say, oh, well, it did that because it desired to move up. So you have a completely empty kind of explanation. It was parodied by Moliere talking about dormitive virtue. Why does opium make you sleep? Oh, because it has a dormitive virtue. It's a completely empty explanation. Whereas Galileo and Descartes wanted to emphasize that their mechanical explanation, in terms of one thing pushing into another, had a genuine intelligibility to it. We could see why the ball moved in that direction, because it's been bashed there. And that makes sense. It provides predictability in a way that Aristotle never could. Now, I want to draw attention to why intelligibility is such a big deal for philosophers uh, around this period, and pe perhaps for philosophers at almost all times and periods. First of all, we've got the claim that man is distinctively, <coughs> distinctively rational. We, unlike the rest of the animal creation, have a power of reason uh, that is, as it were, a copy or an image of God's reason we are able to understand his universe. Moreover, by understanding it, we can see the patterns in it that show God's existence, that prove that it is divinely ordered. So those two things go together. And the paradigm of human understanding, the nearest we can get to God's understanding, comes through things like mathematics. And in particular, when we're able to apply that mathematics to the physical world in the sort of way that Newton did and Descartes aspired to, uh, that gets us close to the sort of reason that God has. Obviously, infinitely lesser uh, in degree, but the same in kind. We now introduce a villain of the piece. And he looks suitably villainous there, the so-called monster of Malmesbury. I have to say, I'm particularly... Uh, interested in Thomas Hobbes 
because he happens to be an alumnus of Hartford College, where I am now. He went to Magdalen Hall, which morphed into Hartford some long time ago. <clears throat> now, Hobbes was very much the bogeyman of the late 17th and into the 18th century. He thought that the only things that exist in the universe are material things. So he wanted to say not only is the behavior of material things comprehensible in this mechanical way, but actually material stuff is all there is. We are material as well. God, if there's a God, must also be material. <clears throat> Now, obviously, this is pretty unsettling. <laughs> If we are material, then that obviously has rather uh, disappointing results when it comes to things like immortality of the soul. It seems to uh, rob an awful lot of religious doctrines of any plausible basis. So it's perhaps not surprising that Hobbes was uh, frequently pilloried, both in his day and after. So. For example, he was, it was debated in London that he might be the cause of the, the plague and the fire in 1666. Uh, in Oxford, his own university, his books were publicly burned. And they were damnable doctrines, false, seditious, and impious. Funniest, I think, is a, is a chap called Daniel Scargill in Cambridge, who was ejected from his college. And then to try to get back in, to try to get his fellowship restored, he recanted. I have lately vented diverse wicked, blasphemous, and atheistical positions professing that I gloried to be an hobbyist and an atheist, agreeably unto which principles I have lived in great licentiousness, swearing rashly, drinking, corrupting others. So <laughs> the idea is, obviously, that if you have these sorts of uh, materialist doctrines, if you think that the only things in the world are material things and therefore you undermine traditional religion, you're bound to be a wicked person. Now, in arguing against Hobbes, the main argument that was used was precisely appealing to the intelligibility of matter. The claim was that by understanding matter in the sort of way that Galileo did, and Descartes and all these others, as something that's pushed around, that's something that, that doesn't have active powers of its own, but is just inert, it immediately becomes possible to argue that materialism must be false. Because, after all, we do have active powers. We are able to think. Matter, if it cannot have active powers, cannot think. And it's very striking to see the list of philosophers who use this argument, uh, either implicitly or explicitly against Hobbes. So Hobbes' Leviathan, the fa very famous book, uh, The War of All Against All and that sort of thing, he's better known nowadays as a political philosopher. Uh, so that was published in 1651, and then we've got Refutations in 1656, 59, 62, 70, 78, 82, leading up to Locke in 1690. Um, and these are only the major ones. There are hosts of philosophers all lining up to condemn Hobbes. And they're all doing it on the same basis, more or less. Namely, materialism can't be right because we can understand the powers of matter and we can see that matter is not capable of doing things that we are notably thinking. Okay, another major figure who comes into this just before Hume is John Locke. Now John Locke, um, as is well known, was an empiricist in the sense that he thought that all of our ideas are derived from experience. We're not able to think of anything that hasn't in some way appeared to our senses. And that was extremely influential on Hume. Um, I think One can see the basis of Hume's philosophy. When he started out, it was hugely driven by that thought, and in particular, applying it to the notion of causation. Now, that's a different story. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, uh, but it is very interesting. I think if, if we're looking for a source of Hume's philosophy, we would find it in that thought combined with uh, discussions about free will and causation, and that, again, links up with what I've been talking about, the inertness or otherwise of matter. But I want to go a slightly different path, um, and I'm going to introduce, uh, for later use, a distinction that Locke uh, made very familiar. It's a 
distinction that's still familiar today, uh, the distinction between deductive and what we call inductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning, what Locke calls demonstrative, is like reasoning in mathematics or logic, where every step follows with ineluctable certainty. Whereas probable reasoning, or we, what we call inductive reason, is more commonsensical, uh, where we draw inferences that seem probable, where the premises make the conclusion likely, uh, but by no means certain. And Locke is generally modest about the limits of demonstrative proof. Locke says quite a bit about probability, because he, unlike some earlier philosophers, like Hobbes, for example, and Descartes, Locke is very well aware that science cannot be all demonstrative. Uh, probability is vitally important. Uh, we have to make do with less than certainty. Except in one case, the existence of God. So, you know, when people describe Locke as a, a, an empiricist, not a rationalist, well, there's still this rationalist core in Locke's philosophy. He thinks that the existence of God can be proved. Well, basically, we know that there must be something from eternity, because if ever there was nothing, there never would be anything. And secondly, uh, we know that the eternal being, whatever it is, must necessarily be a cogitative being, a thinking being. Why? For it is as impossible to conceive that ever bare incogitative matter should produce a thinking intelligent being as that nothing of itself should produce matter. So, same argument again. You can't get thought from matter. Therefore, the eternal being must be a thinking being. So we can prove that God exists. Okay, with that background, we now start uh, coming to David Hume. And I'm going to mention just three Humean masterpieces. There are plenty others that one could mention. These happen to be my favourites, I have to say. Um, but th they are particularly significant. The Treatise of Human Nature, um, certainly his most ambitious philosophical work. It's an absolutely wonderful masterpiece uh, by, published by... Uh, Hume when he was just uh, 28 or 29, um, certainly uh, alone sufficient to make him a great philosopher. Um, in 1748, he published The Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, which is sort of reworking of book one of the treatise. Um, philosophically, on average, stronger. It's got the best bits, as it were, and they are refined and polished. But on the other hand, it's not as ambitious in the, as the treatise doesn't cover as much ground. And finally, the Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, um, a masterpiece, the funniest great work of philosophy ever written. Uh, it's probably the, the greatest work ever in the philosophy of religion, certainly the greatest from the uh, sceptical side. Um, Hume didn't publish it during his lifetime. It was too dangerous, he was persuaded by his friends and probably realised himself that it would get him into trouble. He left the manuscript to Adam Smith to publish, but with a provision that if Adam Smith didn't do it within a couple of years, the manuscript would go to David Hume's nephew, also called David Hume, uh, whose <coughs> duty in publishing it as the last will, wish, the last wish of his uncle uh, would be entirely above reproach. And that's indeed how it got published, by his nephew. The manuscript is still uh, there in the National Library of Scotland, owned, as I said before, by the Royal Society of Edinburgh, an absolute gem. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a very quick outline of perhaps the argument for which Hume is most famous. It's the argument that comes up in uh, the treatise in section 136. Uh, more significantly, it is the centerpiece argument of the inquiry concerning human understanding, the famous argument concerning induction. And then I'm going to suggest that we can see that as lying in important ways behind um, future developments in science, including uh, Darwin, Einstein, quantum mechanics, and so on. You can see why I have to move fast. Okay, suppose we see a yellow billiard ball moving towards a red one and colliding with it. We expect the red one to move. Why? Well, because we think there's a causal connection. There's a causal connection between the hitting and the moving. All right, 
How then do we find out about causal connections? The causal connection doesn't help us to infer what's going to happen unless we know what the causal connection is. Well, Hume gives a very nice thought experiment. Imagine Adam, the first man. He's just been created by God. All his faculties work as well as they could. And he sees one billiard ball moving towards another. And God says to him, well, Adam, what's going to happen when that ball reaches that one? And Hume makes, I think, the very reasonable claim that Adam wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> he just wouldn't know, because it's the first time he's ever seen anything like this. Uh, and if we agree with that, that implies that, quite generally, there's no way that we can know anything about what causes what in advance of experience, as we philosophers say, a priori. A priori, anything could produce anything, as Hume is fond of saying. Uh, so we can only learn about causes from experience. Okay, now what that means then is that in order to be able to make any inference beyond what we immediately perceive or what we remember, let's, let's allow those. Let, we're not questioning here whether our senses are reliable. We're not questioning whether our memory is reliable. But given that, um, it looks like any inference we make beyond that is going to be based on presumed causal relations and therefore is based on extrapolating our experience. We have to be able to learn from the experience that we've had and apply it to new experience that's not yet happened. So we have to take for granted that obser observed phenomena provide a guide, at least a fairly reliable guide, to unobserved phenomena. Okay, now focus on that. What reason do we have for assuming that the past is a guide to the future, that the observed is a reliable guide about the unobserved. Well, let's go through the different kinds of argument or reason that we might have. And uh, there's a nice passage from Hume's letter from a gentleman from 1745. It is common for philosophers to distinguish the kind of evidence into intuitive, demonstrative, sensible, and moral. Okay. So intuition for Hume, as for other philosophers of the period, is self-evident. So some things are self-evident, like one equals one. That's self-evident. Um, demonstrative evidence, well, we've talked about that. Deductive reasoning. Logical, totally infallible step-by-step -step reasoning, like in mathematics. The sensory information, yeah? We're allowing information from the senses, fine. We're not questioning that. And... There's what he calls moral reasoning. In other words, probable reasoning. Okay, so our problem is, how can we justify the assumption that, that what's happened in the past, or what we've observed, is a good guide to what's going to happen in the future, what we haven't observed? Well, it's not self-evident. Okay, We can perfectly well imagine it not turning out that way. So it can't be a matter of immediate logical insight, like seeing that one equals one. Demonstrative reasoning. Well, no, clearly you can't prove it deductively. If you had, if you had a deductive proof that the one billiard ball was going to make the other one move, then it would be completely impossible to imagine coherently anything else happening. But we can easily imagine lots of different things happening, can't we? We can imagine the, the first ball stopping or the second one... Uh, exploding or turning into a frog or jumping up in the air or there's all sorts of things we can imagine we clearly can't deductively prove uh, that it will actually move what about sensory knowledge no well we've already ruled that out think of Adam Adam wasn't able by just looking at the balls to tell what was going to happen he had to draw on the past well that that leaves uh, probable inference or what Hume calls fact, uh, factual inference inference concerning matter of fact or moral reasoning. But Hume has argued that all of that kind of reasoning, all reasoning about the unobserved, depends on this assumption that what we've observed is a good guide to the unobserved. And that's what we're trying to justify. So we've got a circle. If you try to justify extrapolation by appeal to past experience, you're just being circular. So... We conclude that in all reasonings from experience, that means 
any reasoning which takes us from experience beyond it. There is a step taken by the mind, that is, the assumption that the past is a guide to the future, which is not supported by any argument or process of the understanding. We can't give any good reason whatever for supposing that the past is a guide to the future. And many philosophers, including the philosopher in front of you, think that's a good argument with a true conclusion. So Hume goes on to infer that what makes us reason inductively is a kind of habit, what he calls custom. We just take for granted that the observed is a good guide to the unobserved. It's just a sort of animal instinct. But that doesn't mean that Hume's going to slag it off. On the contrary, and this is a crucial change from previous philosophers, uh, Locke, when he talked about this kind of habitual thinking, the association of ideas, seeing A followed by B a lot of times and then you see an A and you think of a B, Locke wanted to say that that kind of thing was madness. There's a kind of madness that, that, that's quite contrary to reason. Whereas Hume wants to say, actually, that particular kind of association of ideas, expecting for the future what we've had in the past, is absolutely fundamental to reasoning about the world. So Bishop Butler had said that probability is the guide of life. Uh, Butler would have agreed with Locke about all that and seen it as based on reason. Hume now echoes that, but with a crucial change. Custom, then, is the great guide of human life. It is that principle alone which renders our experience useful to us and makes us expect for the future a similar train of events with those which have appeared in the past. Without the influence of custom, we should be entirely ignorant of every matter of fact beyond what is immediately present to the memory and senses. There would be an end at once of all action as well as the chief part of speculation. So when we reason about the world, we are fundamentally taking for granted that it works in consistent ways. And it's just as well we take that for granted, because if we didn't, we'd be completely lost. Now, it follows from that that human reason is actually only in degree different from animal reason. You know, previous philosophers had wanted to say, well, we humans, we can have insight into the nature of things. We can look at the billiard ball and see somehow that it's inert, that it has certain powers and doesn't have others. Um, he wants to say no, actually. All we know about billiard balls comes from supposing that future billiard balls will be behave in the same way as we've seen past billiard balls behaving. There's no perception of connections there. And no causal interactions are really intelligible. This intelligibility that previous philosophers were after is just an impossibility. So, Hume very explicitly draws the comparison with other animals. Other animals, as well as men, learn things from experience. Um, they, you know, if, you, if, you, if the dog has gone for a walk lots of times when you've reached up for its lead, when it sees you reach for the lead, it expects to go for a walk. And we're basically doing the same kind of thing when we look at the billiard balls. And it's very interesting in Hume's treatise to see how important this link between humans and animals is. Um, we've got the sections of the reason of animals, of the pride and humility of animals, of the love and hatred of animals. And in every single case, it's the last section of the relevant part of the treatise. I think that's quite significant. Uh, we also get discussion of animals in various other uh, parts of Hume's works. And... Just to say briefly, this is the only thing I will be saying on Hume's theory of morality, uh, one of the areas of Hume's philosophy that is now most influential on contemporary philosophers, again, it's linked to Hume's view of humans as essentially animal. Uh, morality is not based on some sort of rational insight. It's based on human feeling and sympathy for each other, fellow feeling in particular. When we see someone suffer, it makes us suffer. When we see someone happy, we share their happiness. And that's the sort of uh, basis of morality. Okay, now a quick interlude on Darwin. Darwin read quite a lot of Hume's stuff. 
Um, and he was writing on Hume, uh, or, sorry, re reading Hume exactly at the time when he was working out the theory of evolution. So there's a note, for example, about Hume's theory of mind in August, on August the 24th, 1838. Um, he notes his reading of Malthus uh, just about a month later. And in his autobiography, he described that period, Malthus in particular, as giving him the theory by which he would work. Here's just a list of the various notes that Darwin made of uh, Hume texts that he read. And you can see, I mean, some are mentioned more than once, uh, but you can see the essay on human understanding. That's presumably the inquiry concerning human understanding. Uh, he refers to Hume's essays, and he refers to it in a volume that contains all of them. Uh, the Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, The Natural History of Religion, and Hume's History. And here is a note from early 1839 where Darwin refers to Hume's section of The Reason of Animals. Uh, he's reading it not from the treatise, but from the inquiry, uh, section 9 of the Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And he is mentioning that. He's also mentioning Hume's discussion of scepticism later in the inquiry in section 12. And you see the natural history of religion at the bottom. There may be other signs of influence too. Um, this is a passage from the dialogues, uh, very an example of, of, of Hume's humour in discussing the design argument for God's existence, the argument that the universe is so wonderfully designed that we can infer that it must have been created by an infinite benevolent creator. If we survey a ship, what an exalted idea must we form of the ingenuity of the carpenter who framed so complicated, useful, and beautiful a machine? And what surprise must we feel when we find him a stupid mechanic who imitated others and copied an art which through a long succession of ages, after multiplied trials, mistakes, corrections, deliberations, and controversies, had been gradually improving? Many worlds might have been botched and bungled throughout an eternity ere this system was struck out. Now, in The Origin of Species, there's a passage which seems perhaps to echo that. It's certainly not a proof, but one can't help but wonder when reading this whether Darwin didn't get some of the thoughts from Hume. Uh, a savage, when he looks at a ship, thinks it's incomparably wonderful and uh, incomprehensible how, how marvellous the thing, can, thing is. But actually we find uh, that it's produced by the labor, the experience, the reason, and even the blunders of numerous workmen. And he compares that to the view of evolution on animals. We look at an animal, uh, we see it as wonderfully designed. Actually, Darwin is saying, when you look at it from the point of view of evolution, you find that it is produced from lots of trials, bungles, and botches. Uh, the things that work get kept, the things that don't uh, either fade into the background or are eliminated by natural selection. And what we see at the end of that um, looks far more coherent than it actually uh, is. Okay, coming back to Hume then. We've seen that he gives custom, uh, this assumption that the future will resemble the past, a key role in our all of our factual inferences. When we do science, when we uh, draw any conclusions about the unobserved, we're just taking for granted something for which we can give no reason. Well, if we can't give any reason for it, why should we accept it? Isn't the ultimate result of Hume's philosophy an incurable skepticism? Everybody knows, right? Hume's a skeptic, isn't he? Well, not quite, no. Belief arising from inference through custom is the necessary result of placing the mind in such circumstances. So, you've seen lots of billiard balls bash into each other, you see one billiard ball moving towards another, well, I'm afraid you just do infer that the second one's going to move. It's an operation of the soul when we are so situated, as unavoidable as to feel the passion of love when we receive benefits, or hatred when we meet with injuries. 
All of these operations are a species of natural instincts which no reasoning or process of the thought or understanding is able either to produce or to prevent. So, is Hume a skeptic about induction? Well, he does appreciate the force of his own skeptical argument. I mean, I take it the argument that I gave before is a skeptical argument. He calls it that. He calls skeptical doubts about the operations of the understanding. It's skeptical because it's denying some basis in reason which philosophers might think they had. But that doesn't mean that Hume's a skeptic about induction in the sense of having any doubt about whether we should do it or not. Nothing leads us to inductive inference but custom or a certain instinct of our nature, which it's indeed difficult to resist, but which, like other instincts, may be fallacious and deceitful. But when he turns to the skeptic who says, well, okay then, given your skeptical argument, hadn't you better stop relying on induction? He just says to the skeptic, that's a pretty hopeless prescription. The only thing that's going to happen if I stop drawing any conclusions about the future will be that I'll die. Nature unsatisfied will put an end to me. Now, of course, the skeptic could come back at that point and say, well, hang on. You've got no reason for thinking that. You have no justification for believing that if you stop eating, say, you're going to die. Or if you... Uh, walk to the end of a cliff and continue, that it's going to damage you. Because after all, you've got no reason for supposing that the future will resemble the past. And just because people who've fallen off cliffs in the past have been hurt, that gives you no reason whatever to think that you'll be hurt. But Hume can retort to the sceptic, <laughs> well, he could say, go on then, after you. <laughs> and he's confident, if his theory is right, if Hume is right about human nature, whether or not he can justify it by some ultimate criterion, the, skeptic, the, the, the Peronian sceptic too will actually believe that he'll get hurt when he comes off the cliff. Because the fact is that the Peronian sceptic, just like Hume, just like the rest of us, does not have beliefs totally dominated by reason. So in the end, we don't have any choice but to assume that the future will resemble the past. Uh, nature doesn't leave that within our power. And... The conclusion of the argument is to point up, as it were, the whimsical condition of mankind, who must act and reason and believe, though they are not able by their most diligent inquiry to satisfy themselves concerning the foundation of these operations or to remove the objections that may be raised against them. So we can't help reasoning in that way. We can't provide an ultimate justification. But we don't have any particular reason to be worried by the lack of an ultimate justification. And in particular, it doesn't follow from all this that all inferences about the unobserved are equally good or bad, that we've no ground for, uh, as it were, being scientific and adopting science as opposed to scepticism. So one could say an awful lot about here. I mean, it's, but this, this area of Hume interpretation uh, is quite controversial. It's absolutely clear that Hume is a great advocate of inductive science. It's also clear that he very much endorses the argument that I sketched earlier. How exactly he squares all this is not 100% uh, explicit. But essentially, it, I think it's something like this. A priori, without experience, we can't know anything about the way the world works. Trying to aspire to the kind of intelligibility that previous philosophers aspired to is just an impossible dream. Um, everything we know, or every prediction we make, can only be based on experience. And although we can't rationally found the assumption that the future will resemble the past, since we can't help making it, actually the rational thing to do is to go on taking it for granted and adopting it, if you like, as an axiom. Since we can't help believing that the world's ways of working are broadly uniform. Let's take hold onto that as our touchstone of rational science. So what we end up with is a picture of science based on systematization rather than the attempt or the quest for intelligibility. The utmost element of human reason is to reduce the principles productive of natural phenomena to a greater simplicity 
and to resolve the many particular effects into a few general causes by means of reasonings from analogy, experience, and observation. But as to the causes of these general causes, we should in vain attempt their discovery. You can go so far, but ultimately you're going to hit basic principles about the way the world works, and trying to get some ultimate insight into them is doomed to failure. And Hume suggests that things like elasticity, gravitation, cohesion of parts, communication of motion by impulse, he suggests that those are the fundamental points at which we're going to have to stop. Of course, uh, modern scientists would say, no, no, we can go a lot deeper than that. Well, yes, they can. They can go deeper. Uh, but they still have to stop somewhere. Okay, another brief interlude. Um, it's very interesting to note that Albert Einstein um, paid homage to Hume uh, as playing quite a big role in helping him to get to the theory of special relativity. In particular, in questioning the assumption about the absolute character of time. That is, uh, the absoluteness of simultaneity. And this is actually quite pertinent here. Um, if you think that we have some kind of divine-like rational insight into the nature of things, the kind of thing that we can rely on to do Euclidean geometry about the world, for example, the sort of thing that Newton did in his Principia, one of the things we surely know, don't we, by that kind of insight, as firmly as we know anything, is that if event A is simultaneous with event B, and event B is simultaneously, simultaneous with event C, then event A must be, simultaneously, be simultaneous with event C. Isn't that obvious? Isn't that transparent to human reason? And yet, by reading Hume, uh, Einstein came to question it. And that was what enabled him to make the breakthrough with special relativity. In a letter to Schlick, he mentioned uh, Mach and Hume, Still much more Hume, whose treatise on understanding I studied with eagerness and admiration shortly before finding relativity theory. Now I want to give one more illustration of this, but from quantum mechanics. Here we have the two-slit experiment. We've got a light source here, and you can see the light traveling out uh, in those two directions, reaching slits. Uh, in a screen there. The light goes through the slits and then continues on the other side and ultimately it will hit against the screen at the top. So the, the two-slit experiment famously um, gives the following kind of result. You shine light through the two slits and you see what's called an interference pattern. Fine. That's a bit odd. But it seems to be fairly explicable if we take into account that light is a wave. And if you think of light as a wave, so the different colors are designed to show the point in the wave uh, where the different things are. Uh, sorry, Ima imagine a wave in water like that. Uh, the colors represent the point in the wave at which you are. And when the two waves interact together, Imagine dropping two puddles into a pond and you have the waves coming together. If the top of this wave hits the top of that, they'll add together. But if the top of this wave coincides with the bottom of that, they'll cancel out. So you get a kind of interference pattern from the spreading out of the two waves. And that nicely explains the result of the two-slit experiment, doesn't it? Well, hang on a minute. Suppose... Um, Suppose we change our um, apparatus so that instead of uh, having continuous waves of light going out, we just send individual photons one at a time. And this time I'm going to show the flashes on the screen when they... So, what I'm doing now is firing single photons through this apparatus. So we make sure that there's only one as it were, particle of light going through at any point. Uh, Einstein famously identified that light is indeed particulate in that way. And let's see what happens if we do that repeatedly. We still get an interference pattern. How can that be? We're, we're sending individual photons of light. At least that's what we're aspiring to do. 
and yet we're still getting this interference pattern. Maybe what we should do is apply a detector on the two slits so that we can tell as we fire the photons which, fo which slit it's going through. So let's do this. So each time I press this, you can see that one of the detectors is, line is lighting up. Okay, so what that means is we're sending our photons of light out. They're only ever being registered by one detector, never by two. Right. And now let's see what happens. Oh dear. No interference pattern anymore. Or at least not the same interference pattern as we had before. Nothing like. Now, this is very peculiar. Because you would think, wouldn't you, that light going through one slit can only interfere with light going through the other slit if it goes through both. But as soon as we put a detector, in fact, if we put a detector on either of them, we stop getting the interference. But on the other hand, when we have the detectors there, we never see the light going through more than one slit at a time. Now, we can work out what's happening here. We can do our mathematics. We can work out what the various uh, interference patterns will be according to the different experimental setups. But there's no way that scientists got to this theory by sitting in an armchair and just thinking about the way things must be. This isn't intelligible in the sense that the philosophers prior to Hume were aspiring to understand the world. Uh, scientists have been driven towards quantum mechanics, which is fundamentally quite confusing, um, by the phenomena. So I think it's a beautiful illustration of Hume's view of science. Okay, finally, I want to end by um, mentioning the dialogues concerning natural religion, and I want to wind up by showing you uh, the website that we are unveiling today. The dialogues were uh, composed mainly in the early 1750s, but published only after Hume's death, as I mentioned before. In the dialogues, we have three characters. Demir who's uh, a bit of a mystic. He thinks God is incomprehensibly great. Uh, in no way can we understand God in human terms, uh, but we are able to prove his existence by an a priori argument. Then there's Cleanthes, who thinks that God is basically like a human mind, but far, far greater. And the way we can prove God's existence is by looking at the world and seeing that it's analogous to machines. And just as you need a mind, a good mind, to produce a good machine, when we look at the world and look at all its wonderful things, uh, we can be sure that there must be a divine mind behind it. And then we get Philo, who's the Humean skeptic. Uh, most people think Philo basically speaks for Hume. At least, I think they do. I think he, thinks for, he speaks for Hume most of the time, but I think at the end he doesn't. He seems to me to be a bit more like uh, somebody called Pierre Bale, who was a very influential philosopher at the time. Now, <clears throat> Philo at the end of the dialogues comes out with a notoriously puzzling passage. From parts 1 through to 11, Philo has seemed to be something of a sceptic. It seems that he is arguing against Cleanthes, saying that actually to suppose that the design, there is a designer of the universe somewhat like a human mind uh, is actually going well beyond the evidence and is not a reasonable conclusion to draw. But then at section 12, part 12, he says, the cause or causes of order in the universe probably bear some remote analogy to human intelligence. And many people have looked at this and said, ah, there we are, uh, Philo is obviously a theist after all, therefore Hume must be a theist after all. Now, as a nice illustration of the value of being able to look at the original texts, I want to show you, and I hope this will work, here we are. Let me go back a little bit and then I'll come back here. 
So this is uh, our new website, QTEX Online. Um, you can see there um, a whole load of works of Hume. In fact, what we've done is pick out collections of Hume's works. Uh, many of these were produced in many different editions, but we've picked out the key editions, and we've included all of the works in their final authoritative form within those collections. So if we look at the dialogues concerning natural religion here, this is, I say, that you're the first people apart from Henry and me to have seen this. Uh, this is the dialogues concerning natural religion. You can see it's uh, all done in an 18th century style font. Uh, as far as we know, it is completely reliable, apart from the odd editorial um, e editorial correction, and I've made a minimum number of those, very small number. Um, but what's really special about this edition is that uh, there we are. You can actually see at the same time the manuscript which is in the National Library of Scotland and owned by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So, here we have page 79 in the manuscript. And you can see one of the things that stands out with this is quite a few crossings out, insertions, and so forth. So we have an insertion AA over there, which means that sometimes in order to um, read the manuscript, you have to be able to go to another page. So here we've got AA and BB. And you can see that the manuscript has been marked up in such a way that whenever you get an insertion from a different page, you can click there and go and see it. So, what I want to draw your attention to is this insert, which we are confident came on Hume's deathbed. So, the context is that Hume is talking to the theist and the atheist and suggesting to them that actually the difference between them is only one of degree. After all, he says to the theist, surely you agree, don't you, that God is very, very different from us. Oh, oh yes, of course, God is completely different from us. Uh, but on the other hand, he's, yeah, he's like a human mind, but very different. All right, now I turn to the atheist, and I ask him, don't you agree that although you don't think the cause or causes of order in the universe probably bear some remote analogy to human intelligence, or do you? You don't think that there is a God, there is a mind out there creating the world. But surely you must agree that there's a great analogy amongst lots of the operations of nature. Don't you? I mean, for example, the generation of an animal and the operation of the human mind. They're probably energies that bear some remote analogy to each other, or even the rotting of a turnip. And here's the hint that Hume is not here being entirely serious. I will go back to my slide so that you can, I can be confident that you will be able to read this. So, <clears throat> there's Philo's confession that the cause or causes of order in the universe probably bear some remote analogy to human intelligence. And what we now get is the sceptic asked whether there not be a certain degree of analogy among all the operations of nature in every situation and in every age, whether the rotting of a turnip, the generation of an animal, and the structure of human thought be not energies that probably bear some remote analogy to each other. And can you see that that completely undermines the force of the confession? Because the confession seemed involve Philo in acknowledging that there is a cause of the universe somewhat analogous to a human mind. But now he's saying that even the rotting of a turnip is analogous to a human mind. So it completely undermines any, um, as it were, apologetic significance of that earlier, uh, uh, 
uh, of the passage that um, he had written earlier. Now, I'm not sure whether we should read Philo as being uh, tricky here. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. But I certainly think that we should read Hume as being tricky here. I think Hume is giving a message through his manuscript in that way. He's telling us something about how to read his writings uh, and leaving it to posterity. Uh, Sandy Stewart has called uh, this paragraph uh, Hume's dying testament to posterity. Uh, the last thing he wrote in 1776. Um, and again, I think this, is, this illustrates the great virtue of being able to see that one, wonderful manuscript uh, that the uh, National Library houses and that the Royal Society owns. So just to sum up uh, the picture of Hume that comes from all this, his outstanding characteristic, I think particularly in context, is that he's a non-believer. Uh, you can see most of what I've said has been against a, a religious view of man. Uh, he sees man as an animal rather than a semi-divine creature. Um, he sees our reason as a natural operation and analogous to that of animals. And with that, I'm just going to repeat my thanks, at least on the screen, including to my colleague Henry. Thank you very much. Well, we've had a very lively, engaging, and accessible lecture. There's an opportunity now for questions uh, from the floor. I think we have about 15 minutes or so, if Peter is willing to take questions. Uh, there is a roving microphone, so if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Here's one from the fourth row from the front. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it came across very well in your lecture that one of Hume's premises when he's talking about uh, custom is that human nature is always the same. Uh, and this is one of those debates in philosophy that never really goes away. So do you think that there is a way we can still engage with you uh, in time together with debates today about whether or not human nature, as Hume argued quite a lot, particularly in this history, is always the same across all ages and all times. Okay, I, I think <clears throat> I would draw a big distinction between Hume's view about custom, say, and his view about aesthetics, to give an example. So in aesthetics, as in his moral theory, he does tend to assume a great deal of, of um, similarity, at least if you do things rationally and carefully. He thinks that ultimately critics will come to agree much more than they actually seem to. Now, I think there he was, he probably just got it wrong. I mean, I, I am constantly astonished at some of the things, the music in particular that uh, young people appreciate these days, and I, to me sounds like a noise, but no doubt when I was their age, <laughs> it would have been a bit different. Um, now, I think, I think there you can say that Hume probably was, was going too far, but custom's a different case. Because, you see, custom is such a fundamental assumption that things will go on in the same way. Animals do it, after all. Okay? They may not make aesthetic judgments, but they assume that the future will resemble the past. And it's difficult to see how you could possibly survive without assuming that. So I think what the Humean philosopher or scientist now would do, faced with the question, are aesthetic judgments uniform or different amongst, across cultures, would obviously investigate it empirically. That's the only thing to do, do empirical science. So I, so I don't think the, the disunity dis, or lack of uniformity in that kind of thing in any way undermines Hume's, Hume's uh, should we say, principles, um, except that it, it would require modification of some of his doctrines. Okay. We could actually move the microphone to the table oh, if you wish. Right. Yes, there's a question from Stuart Sutherland. Uh, just... To your right, there's a microphone there. Uh. Thanks very much. Much enjoyed your lecture, and particularly uh, the attention you paid to Hume's sense of humor and his use of irony, not often stressed, but it's actually fundamental to understanding Hume. And I wonder if at the very end of the dialogues and the passages you were properly paying close attention to, 
one of the points, of course, you can get away with irony. You don't need to do the, uh, the Dawkins thing and put a stake through the heart of Christianity because what Hume most wanted was to tease apart morality and religion so that morality was no longer seen to be founded on religion and as for the rest and the theory and the explanations and so on well let, let's toy with those and, and, and play with them there's a lot in that I mean one thing you find if you go to, section, to part 12 of the dialogues is quite a lot of discussion about religious morality and I think that one reason why Hume um, is perhaps reluctant to express the depth of his sceptical views is that he wants what he says about morality to be taken more seriously. So, for example, he talks about true religion and he contrasts superstition and um, fanatical religion with true religion. And I think in doing so, what he's wanting to do is reach out to people and say, look, I'm not against all religion, but look at the excesses of these people who go around burning each other or fighting wars or, you know, whatever. Um, it, adopting a religious facade makes it much easier to make that kind of point. And certainly, I, I, I think his opposition to religion is driven at least as much morally as metaphysically. Yeah. A gentleman with a red pullover and then from the third row here. Yeah, I'd just like to pursue again this issue of, of custom and almost deductive theory. And I wonder what your view would be on Hume's take on what has been happening of late with the exponential rate of change, let's say, and that custom is really no measure. For instance, who could have predicted five years ago the pace of the Internet, the, the, the impact of Twitter? on international law, let's say, and therefore that deductive custom is falling apart at the seams with this exponential rate of change. Right. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I want to draw a distinction here because uh, Hume is often thought to be um, an advocate of custom in more than one way. Uh, he's very suspicious of revolutionary theories and he thinks that um, social organisation uh, tends to evolve over time. So, if you have an institution that works very well, uh, the fact that it's worked well in the past is quite a good reason for going on with it rather than trying to replace it with some revolutionary alternative. Now, that, uh, there, what he's doing is, is advocating taking seriously customs in the sense of human customs. But custom in the, in the way I was talking about it in my talk that's different. That's a, a particular technical notion of custom, which is purely assuming that the fundamental ways of working of the universe are the same in the future as in the past. Now, I didn't talk about Hume's theory of causation and determinism and all the rest, but Hume actually has quite a sophisticated theory where he says, if you find that superficially the way the world works doesn't seem uniform, dig down for deeper laws and experience tells us that generally you'll find them. So what the scientist is supposed to do is not, as it were, apply custom just at the very superficial level. Uh, the scientist is supposed to dig deeper to find the real uniform laws which drive things. And I, I don't see why that shouldn't lead him down to you know, quantum mechanics and uh, cognitive science and you know, modern experimental psychology and so forth. Um, there's no reason why he should assume that the, the large-scale phenomena are going to just carry on in the same old way. Gentleman on the third row, second in. Thank, thank you, the Royal Guild. A, a recent copy of The New Scientist featured an article uh, showing that in the last so many million years, everything has been eradicated on the Earth. Uh, what A would Hume have made of that? And B, what do you make of it? Yeah, everything has been eradicated on the earth. I, I'm sorry, I don't... I, I, all life. I, well, I think it's still here. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know the article I'm for. Is it saying that at some point in the past there was a complete eradication? I mean, I... Yes, the, that's oh, well, that's... Um, at least it's been going since the Precambrian times continuously. So I, 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 
I'm very sceptical, actually, uh, as a Humean, of any claim that, uh, to knowing that there was, uh, there was life previously, before that period, which got wiped out, because I don't know where you'd find traces of it. I don't really know what to say about that. I have to look at the article. Another question? Gentleman in the front row and then third row. I think it's worth pursuing that uh, uh, similarity, or rather a distinction between religion and, and morality to its, its centre point, Peter, which I think, if I read Hume right in the dialogues and the natural history, what he's objecting to most in revealed religion is the imposition of a morality by revealed religion, the invention of crimes and the prescription of rewards for, 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 for uh, good behaviour. That is not the, the function, says Hume, of revealed religion. It must reside, good morality must reside with a divine being if one can be shown to exist. Yes, I mean, the, the, the actual thing he objects to even more strongly, I think, than, uh, than what you described is the erection of completely spurious uh, virtues. So, suppose there was a god who gave us a reward for acting well, for doing good things. That at least would be a spur to moral behaviour. But what Hume wants to say is that actually religion corrupts morality in, in something like the following sort of ways. So uh, when I was at university, I had a friend who, um, who had this theory about how to impress uh, young ladies. <coughs> and the theory was, buy them flowers. And so, why flowers? Well, flowers are useless. They don't do anything. They cost a lot. And they die quickly. Why would you bother to buy flowers? Well, the only possible reason for buying the flowers is that you're devoted to her. So think what a wonderful impact that will have. Now, Hume's theory about God, or about religion, and the way it corrupts morality, is very like that. Suppose you believe in God, and you're thinking, oh, shall I do a good turn to my neighbour? Well, I'd do that anyway. That, that's, that's a perfectly good thing to do whether there's a God or not. If I want to show favour to God, I've got to do something special that I'd never dream of doing otherwise. I'll flagellate myself, wear sackcloth and ashes, uh, wear garments that have um, nails pointing inwards, do all these kinds of things. And so Hume, Hume thinks that in that sort of way, religion erects quite spurious morality. He also thinks that people who are religious have a particular danger that because within religion your fervour and devotion can seem like a very good thing, but being human we don't feel that kind of thing all the time. Sometimes we get tired or you know, feel like indulging other desires. The problem is we get into a habit of dissimulation. We f feel that we've constantly got to pretend to more fervour than we actually feel. And therefore, it encourages a certain kind of dishonesty. So, I mean, Hume says quite a lot on this kind of thing about how religion you know, actually corrupts morality by presenting as virtues things that actually aren't virtuous. There's a lovely passage in the... Um, uh, I wonder if I can... Moral inquiry? Um, the inquiry concerning the principles of morals, 1751. Here we are. It's page 270 in Selby Big. <laughs> <laughs> I've shown my age. I wish I knew the paragraph number, but I know the page number in Selby Big. Here we are. As every quality which is useful or agreeable to ourselves or others, is in common life allowed to be a part of personal merit, so no other will ever be received where men judge of things by their natural unprejudiced reason without the delusive glosses of superstition and false religion. Celibacy, fasting, penance, mortification, self-denial, humility, silence, solitude, and the whole train of monkish virtues for what reason are they everywhere rejected by men of sense? But because they serve to no manner of purpose, neither advance a man's fortune in the world, so they're not useful to himself, nor render him a more valuable member of society, so they're not useful to others, 
neither qualify him for the entertainment of company, so they're not agreeable to others, nor increase his power of self-enjoyment, so they're not agreeable to him. We observe, on the contrary, that they cross all these desirable ends, stupefy the understanding and harden the heart, obscure the fancy and sour the temper. We justly, therefore, transfer them to the opposite column and place them in the catalogue of vices. Nor has any superstition force sufficient among men of the world to pervert entirely these natural sentiments. A gloomy, hair-brained enthusiast, after his death, may have a place in the calendar, may be made a saint, but will scarcely ever be admitted when alive into intimacy and society, except by those who are as delirious and dismal as himself. <laughs> It's so nice to have these texts online. Somebody should do it. <laughs> <laughs> we might have one last question, I think. Uh, Pauline, second front row. Um, thank you very much, Michelle. Wait for the microphone. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed the way you tied together science and superstition. Oh, turn it on. Sorry, put it up to your mouth. Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you don't know. Okay. I enjoyed the way you tied together science um, and superstition and, and the scepticism. Um, I have a, a question that's a bit of a follow-up on some things that have already been mentioned and it has to do with induction and custom. And I would, you, you said in the response to one of the questions that um, science, scientists should be looking at the, the fundamental principles Hume, however, um, was looking at the, the microscopic. So is, is it not the case that Hume's theory of custom is based upon the things that are most visible in our, and, and sort of at the top level of our experience? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I haven't, well, I could carry on. <laughs> Oh, it's not. Now um, hmm. oh, there we are. Right. Uh, inquiry concerning human understanding. It's eight. Yeah, eight thirteen. Mm -hmm. I'll do a paragraph link this time. Eight point thirteen. There we go. <clears throat> so what Hume says is the vulgar who take things according to their first appearance attribute the uncertainty of e events to such an uncertainty in the causes as makes the latter often fail of their usual influence. So the vulgar, the ordinary people, see something happen one way sometimes and some way another, and they just say, oh, well, sometimes it's like that. But philosophers, he means, of course, natural scientists here rather than, I mean, natural philosophers rather than, as it were, speculative armchair philosophers. <sighs> Sorry. Um, Sorry, that wasn't a dig at anyone in particular. <laughs> um, observing almost in every part of nature, there is contained a vast variety of springs and principles which are hid by reason of their minuteness or remoteness. Find that it is at least possible the contrariety of events may not proceed from any contingency in the cause, but from the secret operation of contrary causes. And then he goes on to say that actually when they do that, when they investigate deeper, they do find that lower down, there are uniformities. So, now, Hume, Hume doesn't say an awful lot about this kind of thing, but there's enough there, and it's very consistent, particularly in the first inquiry. Uh, I think it, it, it's, it's not so obvious in Hume, because there's, um, in the treatise, um, the, the main emphasis of Hume's philosophy is, if you like, on, on the psychology of it all. Um, whereas in the inquiry you get a bit more, proportionally quite a lot more, on how science ought to be conducted. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that says about doing experiments, find out what the uniformities are. Um, for example, working out whether the energy of a moving body is in proportion to the, the velocity or the square of the velocity and so on. Okay. Um, there's plenty there to justify the, the kind of um, rigorous mm -hmm. science that looks for underlying causes behind the... Well, let, let me explain what's at the back of my mind behind these, these questions, that, um, that the, the question that I asked you. And it's the issue of climate change. Because 
we're, we're moving into a period where the, the, past, the, the future is, doesn't look as if it is actually going to resemble the past. And scientists may well have be looking into the, into the fundamental causes here. The general population is still operating um, yes. on, a, on the psychological level. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, one thing I think is very striking if you look at human behavior is that how even a uniformity that lasts for 20 or 30 years can be taken as absolute solid, absolutely solid. I mean, look at the financial world or whatever. And people look back and they say, oh, it's, you know, house prices always go up or whatever it might be. And you look at the period that they're describing and it's actually a very short time. You know, just a decade and a half before I was born, there was a war going on, a very large war. And the world was very, very different. And yet, you know, I'm inclined to naturally assume that the way things have been over my lifetime are going to continue to be the same. And I think climate change is a, uh, highlights a problem here. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, it is very sad. The trouble is, we, we, we are too inclined that way. Now, I don't think a human ought to be so seduced as human should be aware that many people have come a cropper in the past by assuming that their limited experience is a good guide. Um, I think if we're human alive now, he would be saying we should do the science as, as well as we possibly can. And at this point, I can just give a little plug for computer models, because with a different hat on, uh, it was mentioned I, I'm very keen on links between computer science and philosophy. I think the, the way forward here is to look for philosophers to look very carefully at computer models and how much we can rely on those and uh, thinking about that kind of thing. Because future science is all going to depend, I think, or an awful lot of it will depend, on being able to assess reliably the results of computer analyses of phenomena that we've not yet encountered. But obviously we're assuming that the underlying rules are the same as those that have happened in the past. So again, it's, it's not a problem with inductive science. It's just a problem with complexity. The world is so complicated and things interact so much that our rather uh, everyday superficial inferences can fail to be reliable. And I, if Hume were alive now, he would surely be a great fan of empirical computer modelling. <laughs> Plug on which to end. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm sorry to those of you who would like to ask further questions that we're out of time. I, I think uh, Dr. Milliken will be happy to speak to you at the end of the lecture if, if you wish to have some further conversation. But in the meantime, I'm going to call upon Professor Susan Manning, who is Grierson Professor of English Literature and Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities at Edinburgh University. Thank you very much, David. Um, it's my privilege on behalf of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and uh, of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities to propose a vote of thanks to Peter Milliken for his lecture this evening. It seems unfortunate to be the fate of votes of thanks to reiterate complicated arguments as platitudes, and so I will try and be brief. But we have had a real treat tonight, and I think it deserves to be recognized uh, and applauded. Peter has given us uh, a tour of the history of philosophy, uh, a tour de force, uh, which has gone all the way from Aristotle to quantum physics and mechanics by way of excursus into Darwin and Einstein. He's given us a sense of the really important issues that Hume engaged with and his contribution, his unrivaled contribution to those, and he's given a sense of why these issues really continue to matter, why they concern philosophers today as much as 300 years ago, and why they should or might concern us. But a little bit more than that, uh, he's given us an example of uh, a certain kind of thinking that I would associate with Hume, ambitious, learned, current, uh, accessible, and attractive. Now, it doesn't seem to me that there are many people who could discuss Hume's work in Hume's terms with such authority. And if Hume's writing is still, after 300 years, or giving or taking time for him to get born and grow up and write them, 250 years, then I think we can say that Peter's own standing as a philosophy 
will have the kind of longevity that it deserves on the basis of tonight's performance. So we've had uh, this wonderful combination of learning and accessibility. I'd like to add to that something else that I think Peter shares and that he's indicated that he shares with Hume, and that is a leavening of mischief. It's been a delightful as well as a very educative experience, and I think you will understand why it's been for us a huge privilege, but also a great pleasure to have Peter as uh, our alumni David Hume Fellow at the Institute in Edinburgh periodically over the last year. We are, as David said at the beginning, enormously grateful to the alumni for making this possible and to Peter for being such an exemplary, such a generous uh, fellow uh, in the way that he has been. So I invite you to join me in thanking him once again for an absolutely terrific lecture. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.